As of today, there's a new Reuters Ipsos poll, a national poll we should point out, that shows her about two points ahead of Donald Trump. The U.S. election took yet another dramatic turn last weekend as President Biden announced that he would not be standing for re-election. That decision came following mounting pressure from the Democratic Party on him to drop out, following what many people consider to be a disastrous performance in his televised debate against Donald Trump, one that raised plenty of concerns about his age and his cognitive abilities. Kamala Harris is now the presumptive nominee. Let's get more with The National's Cody Combs. Cody, we'll get in a moment to what a potential Harris presidency might mean for Middle East policy. But first of all, how much chaos is this going to cause the Democrats changing the candidate just three odd months before the election? Well, let's make no mistake. After that debate performance, Joe Biden was very vulnerable. And there were legitimate concerns, I think, by any objective standard about his health following that debate performance. That said, if you go back to 2020, during that election when he defeated Donald Trump, approximately 81 million people voted for Joe Biden. That's more than anybody else has ever received in U.S. election history. So to jettison the president, the incumbent president from the ticket, is very, very risky. Even if the Democrats see upside right now, that is incredibly risky to take away that power of incumbency and all those 81 million votes that he had. Mm -hmm. To just jettison him from the ticket is quite amazing, even with all the uphill challenges he faced because of that debate performance. That said, there was potential for a lot of chaos that we haven't seen yet, and I don't think we'll see, because what you want to see happen right now, if you're a Democrat, is to have everybody rally around Kamala Harris. You don't want to have a contested convention. You don't mm. want to have verbal arguments on the convention floor, and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Most estimates show that she has the required support to become the nominee come that convention in August. And if you're a Democrat right now, that's a good place to be because you want to show unity at that convention. You want to show the country that's watching at home, okay, we're grown-ups, we've got this under control. Mm. It's a big deal, though. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get to Harris and her popularity, her profile. Do we know anything about what the polling shows about whether she has a better or a worse chance than Biden in a head-to-head -head against Trump? As of today, there's a new Reuters Ipsos poll a national poll, we should point out, that shows her about two points ahead of Donald Trump. Now, take that with a grain of salt, however, because I pointed this out back when the polls showed Biden behind as well. Mm. These national polls, this far out before the election, have almost zero predictive value as to who's going to win. If we trusted these polls that much, we would have looked at a President Michael Dukakis in 1988. He lost that election. We would also be looking at President John Kerry he lost that election. I'm not trying to say these polls are meaningless. However, we shouldn't put too much stock in the national polls right now. If any polls we're looking at, we should look at the state-by-state -state polls. Kamala Harris is doing much better in states like Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina even. However, it's still looking like her numbers are a little bit soft in the Midwest states, which are crucial if the Democrats want to keep the White House. That said, there's still a lot of time and there's clearly that enthusiasm gap that you saw when Biden was on the ticket, that's gone now. Mm -hmm. She's raising a lot of money. Democrats are really, really behind Kamala Harris. So there's plenty of time for her to make up that ground in those Midwestern states. And it's going relatively well for her. However, a lot can change really fast as we've seen over the past few weeks. Yeah, interesting what you say about the polls. I feel like they've really taken a knock Ever since 2016, you know, Hillary famously blew a 3-1 lead. That's what the polls say. And that was the same year as the, uh, the Brexit referendum in the UK uh, that, that I remember very well. All the polls there you know, did not have uh, the, the, the Brexiteers winning that. So, yeah, we have to take the polls with a, with a pinch of salt. And not to get too off track, because I know this is not the main thrust of this episode, but the pollsters, at least the ones I'm speaking with, are still trying to figure out exactly what went wrong. Mm. It's not as easy to contact people anymore. They've got cell phones. People are very paranoid about picking up their phones. You have robo-dialing still, but they still haven't found that secret sauce that they used to have back when it was much easier to pull mm. people. So they're still trying to, to address what went wrong and how to make it more accurate. They might nail it this time and get it completely accurate, but there's still a lot of skepticism. There is. Let's get back to the campaign. Yeah. So we've already had Harris and uh, Trump trade in barbs. What have they said about each other so far? Right out of the gate, Donald Trump, and kind of predictably, on Truth Social, he said something to the effect of that he wishes that his campaign could get a refund from all the money that they spent on Biden. So that's where his mental state was at that time. However, he's now, with his traditional bluster, saying, oh, well, she's easier to defeat 
than Joe Biden. But make no mistake, they were preparing to run against Biden, and they were feeling really, really confident about it. So this is a little bit of a surprise, I think, to them. Whether or not it should be a surprise, you know, people can debate about that for a long time. But they wanted to run against Biden, and now they're not. So from their perspective, I think, in the darkest of corners, they're saying, OK, we've got to regroup. What do we do now? Kamala Harris, however, uh, the Democrats have enthusiasm now, which is something they hadn't had for months. Mm. In terms of policy, is there any daylight between what Harris might stand for and Biden? I know, for example, she's been far more outspoken on women's reproductive rights, for example. Um, Middle East aside, which we'll get to in a minute, are there any more domestic issues where she might differ from Biden? I think you're going to see her be a little bit more friendly to big tech. And I say that because she was attorney general in California. She was a senator also in California. And the big tech CEOs tend to really, really like her. At least that's what we're being told right now. I don't... Joe Biden was very populist with his economic policies and he was very vocal about those policies. Mm. She has not traditionally in the past been as, as prolific in terms of being, you know, blue collar populist economic policies. She's going to have to, though, if she wants those Midwest votes. It remains mm. to be seen if she's going to adopt the same tone that Joe Biden had. I think she will, but we'll see. She's big on social policies. We're definitely going to see her out there when it comes to Roe v. Wade. But those economic policies, I think it's a little bit un uncharted territory for her. Mm. Let's get to the Middle East now. Is she going to differ from Biden uh, in, in terms of a handling of Gaza? I know that she came out in March and called for an immediate ceasefire but then her husband is Jewish and uh, you know, has a lot of links to the Jewish community in America. Do you think there's going to be any change in policy with regard to that if she wins the presidency? I think it's naive to think that there was going to be a huge shift in policy. That's really baked into the Democratic platform right now. And you know, many will disagree about as to how baked in it is, but I don't think you're going to see too much difference, at least not superficially. However, we should point out Benjamin Netanyahu landed in the United States not too long ago on a plane she was not there to meet him. So a lot can change. So do you think there's anything she can do to win back a lot of that Arab American or Muslim American vote that has completely abandoned by, uh, you know, Biden because of his handling of the crisis? It's a very tough road ahead, but a little bit of gestures go a long way. We've already seen in Michigan where the former Detroit health commissioner, Abdul Al-Sayed, pretty much said, Okay, it's time to close ranks. I support Kamala Harris. He's a very prominent voice in the Arab American community in Michigan. He's just one vote, however. I should point out that in recent history, yes, the Arab American vote has traditionally gone to the Democratic Party, but it's not monolithic. Before George W. Bush's presidency, they actually tended to skew conservative. So it's not surprising that you're seeing this sort of shatter belt of where the votes are going in the Arab American community. She does face a tough road ahead to regain some of that trust. Many speculate, however, that the Arab American vote that in recent years has been tr traditionally democratic is in fact going to come home because at the end of the day, it's going to be a choice between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. We'll see. We will see. Cody, thank you very much. And that's it for this episode of A Closer Look. Remember, you can catch all the other shows in the series on our YouTube channel.